Gire from Swan Lake First Nation in Manitoba. She is part of the Bear Clan. She is 18 years old and the owner and founder of Anishinaabe Bimi Wishu Corporation, the first business ever to manufacture jingle dress cones in Canada. Give her a round of applause. Good job. She's also an international hoop dancer, a professional cultural dancer, an artist, and a part of the youth treaty movement, and she's also the oldest sibling of 11. Uh, hi guys, good morning. Um, so thank you for the introduction. I am Kozo, Niji Anishinaabe, Mamengo Ekwe, Nidej Nagas, Gabes Pigamam, Maskat Shizu Naudem. My name is Emma McKenning. Uh, just to kind of repeat what she said, I'm from Swan Lake First Nation, Manitoba. This is just a little bit about myself. 18 years old from uh, uh, Treaty 1. I actually live in Samson. Uh, I was a former, or I just finished my first year at Muscatchee's Cultural College taking my Indigenous Business Diploma. Um, I might transfer to U of A or to another university. I don't know. I like, I like traveling. Um, I am the 2018 Youth Entrepreneur of the Year by uh, Smart. Uh, I also received a few more awards last year and then this year, just last week, I um, Wap Kinyu, I don't know if you guys know him, he is a politician, he's an indigenous politician. He gave me a member statement at the uh, Manitoba Legislative. So that's just a few of my accomplishments. Uh, international hoop dancer, I traveled seven countries until I was 16 years old uh, hoop dancing. So I do a lot of uh, hoop things. Kind of slow down because I really want to focus on education. Um, uh, Palo dancer, student youth tree movement. I'm not going to. Um, really talk about the youth treaty movement because I'm um, going to be talking more about um, dancing and the business. But youth treaty movement is something that myself and two colleagues we created in hopes to bring more awareness and knowledge about treaty to youth across Canada. And good morning. So Swan Lake is, I say 13 hours because you still have the gas stops and all that stuff. 13 hours away, and that's where I'm from. My dad is from there. Um, my mom, I don't really know where she's, she's from. She's just French, she's not native. Uh, but we, but most of her family is from Winnipeg. Um, something to talk about that Swan Lake, um, unlike here when I go to ground dances and stuff, there's tons of people wearing uh, ribbon shirts and ribbon skirts, and even when I went on the Powell Trail here in Alberta, there's tons of dancers. Uh, back in Manitoba, there's not a lot of dancers. Uh, there's maybe three people in my category. Um, in my reserve, I was the first dancer. And um, this is a picture of my community. What we have is uh, uh, we do a lot of sun dancing. Uh, so that's um, uh, more of a spiritual, uh, traditional thing than uh, Paul dancing. Uh, how I started dancing, uh, my mom actually, my mom, uh, she knew that it was important for me to have, or to understand both of my identities, uh, the francophone and then the Anishinaabe. So uh, we went to the, the Festival du Voyageur, which is a French um, festival, and, and um, uh, we follow, uh, we do a lot of painting and stuff like that. And then I went to French public schools and I uh, received my French high school diploma. Uh, but with also that, my mom, uh, she, she got me my first Jingle dress outfit um, back home. Um, it's all Treaty One and Southern Manitoba. There's a lot of Anishinaabe's, and with a lot of the Anishinaabe, there's a lot of the jingle dress dancers because in Ontario, and more so Ontario, 
Um, that's where they are in the Whitefish Bay First Nation. That's where they created the jingle dress. But around that area, they do a lot of, they incorporate jingle dress stats into the ceremonies. Uh, so I kind of switched from jingle dress dancing to fancy shawl because I really like the fast songs and my mom, she made me go into a powwow club. There was a school of powwow in, in Winnipeg and then um, I never really went to, to powwows, maybe like one or two, but I participated in those powwow clubs. Um, my mom, even though she's not native, she learned to be so that she could teach me how to be. She learned how to make um, powwow regalias, and they, they, at first they weren't that uh, pretty, kind of crooked, kind of whatever, but she learned how to sew so that uh, myself and my siblings would be able to sew and make our own outfits, because over there, even with the, the trading posts and stuff like that, there's, there's not a lot of that. And then when I was 13 years old, so this was about 2012, we went to uh, Broken Head Powwow, which was uh, maybe, yeah, the, the size of the powwow was like the, the yellow lines, maybe a little bit small. So it was a very small powwow, and it was supper break, and I was just sitting there with my poutine, and then there is this male hoop dancer that was there. And then he had about 18, 20 hoops. And I was so amazed because I was like, oh, like, that's so cool because I've never seen that before. And I'm like, huh, well, maybe I should just do that one day. And then my mom, she pushed me. She's like, oh, really? Okay, fine then. Let's go get the supplies and go talk to him. And I just looked at him and I was like, what? He's like, you want me to go talk to him? I'm like, no, I don't want to. <laughs> Just a real fat girl moment. <laughs> um, so we went to go talk to him, and I still, um, I still talk to him from time to time, or whenever I see him, I give him a hug. He's kind of like an uncle now. And so we went to you know, Home Depot. We went to Home Depot. We got the supplies that he gave us. The first set of hoops we made, they we, they're kind of bad quality. <laughs> But I, um, because I was so passionate about hoop dancing, um, that I actually practiced eight hours a day, every day, all summer long. And I didn't use a teacher because Winnipeg, if you look at the, the slide before, you see Swan Lake, Swan Lake's that way, and then Winnipeg's over there. So um, if I were to actually get that, dance lessons, I would have to drive uh, two hours a day there for a two hour session and then two hours back. I was 13, I didn't have a job, I don't have my license. My mom, she has a job, she doesn't have a license, you know, we had a life so we couldn't, we couldn't do that. So what I did is I actually went on YouTube, I looked at hoop dancing on YouTube and I tried to like kind of mimic what they did. And it was really, it was kind of hard because if you look at these videos on YouTube, they do it so fast. So then I press play, and then all of a sudden they're jumping from one hoop to another to another. And I'm like, what the heck? How do you, how do, you do that? So I kind of have to slow it down. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and then I had a lot of bruises on my forehead <laughs> from the hoops. There was a lot of times where I would just sit down and then I would kind of like tear up and I'd be like, oh my God, this is so hard. I wish I just had someone. But what my mom did whenever she seen me like that, she just told me, she was like, you know what? I was like, if you don't do it, who else is gonna do that? You know, and that's what she, she's been telling me ever since. Um, so around three weeks later, so eight hours a day, every day, I managed to do nine, no, I think five hoops, and about four minutes long. And um, so we went to Sioux Valley Dakota Nation for a pal and I asked if I could exhibit. And um, what I did is I wore a long black shirt. I made a kind of cheapish hoop skirt thingy. It was an extra hoop skirt. 
about the screen set, but it was just a ribbon skirt that I made that was about this long. And then I had my vinyl moccasins because at the time I didn't have bead work, and then my um, my my uh, uh, cotton leggings. And then so after that, um, I think that day I did kind of mistakes. <laughs> if I were to look back in that video. I'd probably cringe so hard and be like, no, don't show me, that's so ugly. <laughs> but then right after that one, um, hello? Yeah. Uh, there, there's a lady, her name is Candice. She went up to me and she was like, oh, wow. I was like, you, you did pretty good. Like, how long have you been dancing? And I'm sure she just said that to be nice. <laughs> and I was like, oh, this was my first time. And she's like, oh, well, do you want to? dance at the um, Indigenous Music Awards and that's when they had it at the MTS Center. Now it's a bit more smaller. And I was like, uh, okay. <laughs> and then so I went there and then the second performance that I had was about 2,000 people and I was alive. So it went from the crowd to maybe 200 people to 2,000. And um, it was my aunties, they made me a hoop outfit. They were like, hey, no, you're not going to wear that silly skirt of yours. You can actually make you an outfit. So, yeah. And then after that, I kind of, it was the, it was the passion that I had, and I didn't want to give up. Um, and then eventually I started, or after that, um, that music awards show, there was other hoop dancers, and I got them all on social media. And I was like, uh, I'm a... I'm a beginner, so if you could please take the time to kind of teach me a little bit of something. So even before we performed, they kind of helped me do like a couple moves and stuff. And even after that, um, they'll like send me videos or people will take me in videos. And uh, that's how I end. This was in Cuba. So after one year, I managed to do 15 hoops. So then um, after that, there was more popularity because uh, something that you don't see is a lot of uh, female hoop dancers. You always see male hoop dancers, but there's little to no female hoop dancer. So I think that kind of gained interest in the public. Oh, that's a female hoop dancer. Um, so I got this, that's an article that they created with me. And then that was at U of M. So that's how many hoops that I do now. I think that's 18. And I, I can go up to 21, but I'd rather not to. <laughs> I'm a little lazy. <laughs> um, but um, now, because of just um, talking, but like, taking the time or the effort to even say hi to people, or reconnecting with people, and stuff like that, it gave me a lot more opportunities than if I were to just be shy and quiet and, and timid. So that's something that I like to say. Like, if you want to do it, do it. <laughs> um, so when I was about fifth, fifth, yeah, 15, I was a hoop dancer. I went to different powwows, kind of explored more Saskatchewan, Ontario. Um, whatever gas, whatever earnings I had, I just used it for gas money. And it was my mom who always drove me. So it'd be me and my mom and my siblings. Um, and, and they're not native too, so, uh, so it's kind of cool, and it's actually pretty cool how my mom did that, considering that she's not a native, and same with my, my younger siblings, um, it kind of just, uh, how do I put it into that, um, it's kind of cool how accepting the indigenous community is, because, uh, like if my mom were to go to like the small lake to my reserve, there'd be like about five people, oh hey Nat, how's it going? You know, even if we go to Powell's and stuff, my mom, uh, she'd be walking and then people would be like, oh Nat, nice to see you, where's your kids? <laughs> um, so that's pretty neat. Uh, jingle concert, so um, as I mentioned, I usually switch from fancy to jingle, fancy to jingle because my, my cuckoos, they'd be like, I'm like, dance jingle. That's an Anishinaabe dance, dance jingle. So I'd be like, okay, fine. <laughs> so I wanted to make myself a jingle dress. And the, the old man that used to make the cones, or no, he used to get someone from the States to make the cones and then he'd turn around and sell them. Uh, he retired from old age. 
And then the next store or person that would sell phones would be Winnipeg. So again, a two hour drive. And then when I went there, there were $45 a bag. But I still had to buy the buys, take the thread, the, the zipper, the, the fabric and all that stuff. So it ended up costing me over $300 for a dress. And then on the way back, I was, you know how like, when you're bored in a vehicle, all the passengers seat, and you just start looking at random things. You just start grabbing these cards or these pens or whatever. Well, I was looking at these bags of jingles. And I was like, what the heck? Why are they made in Taiwan? And I was like, mom, I was like, look, they're made in Taiwan. I was like, hold up, let me see, look at the other brand. And then the other brand is made in India. And then um, because I grew up where my mom would always take me to the reserve to go visit my, my cuckoo and stuff. They would always feed me this Anishinaabe knowledge. And um, I knew that the jingle dress cones, you know, they were a sacred object, right? They represented healing. And then, um, like in the story that follows through, and like it was, it's kind of like, I kind of felt like kind of, kind of insulted, kind of like, uh, why is it made in Taiwan? And then the more I did my research, it wasn't even made or owned by an indigenous person. It was a non-indigenous person that made um, kind of these knockoff things. And then, um, and then uh, sold them to various people, like these knockoff native objects. And then the jingle dress cones were one of them. Um, so then I was like, same thing as hoop dancing. I was like, you know what? I was like, I should just start a company named Jingles. And then my mom, she's like, oh yeah? Well, come up with a, a logo and a, a name, and then I'll take you serious. And I was like, Mom, I was just kidding. You don't need to do that. <laughs> you don't need to take me serious. And she was like, no, else. She was like, if you don't do it, who else will? So then um, the next day, um, I took a computer science class with, with Photoshop and Illustrator. And what I did is, I created a logo and I wanted a logo that just that didn't just look nice, that had meaning and I wish I had the the logo with me, but I don't. And um oh well. Uh I'll have my class. So if you want to know more, <laughs> uh come see my my vendor booth. Um and then I came up with the name Anishinaabe the Mishimo. I wanted a an Anishinaabe Moen uh, this, uh, business name because I wanted to be as authentic as possible. I wanted to only support local people because I'm a huge fan of you know all these small local businesses, right? I'd rather give my money to a local grocery store than to a Walmart. That's just the type of person I am. Um, and I wanted it to, to first off, to not be made in Taiwan or India. <laughs> I wanted to be made in Canada. And I wanted to have um, like an Anishinaabe Moan name. I wanted the logo to have meaning and to have a story. So I came up with, oh, those ones are <laughs> I forgot about that picture. And, um, and then the more I did my research and stuff on creating a business plan, the more I kind of grew passionate about it. And even just the metal itself, it took me six months of research because I wanted the metal to be the exact same as the first jingle dress cones. I paid two grand myself just to just so that I can find out what kind of metal it was, and that's the co that's the metal that's used into those cones. Um, also, I was paying forty five dollars a bag. Well, I usually you roughly use between two to four. So if you do the math, that's a lot of money. So what we did is we managed to find out ways like cutting off the middleman and stuff like that and um, to be able to bring the cost down. And now we actually sell them for $25 a bag, which is pretty cool. And then we have the basic three colors, two different sizes, but this is a secret that I'm gonna tell you guys. Um, where I'm actually <laughs> developing a red jingle dress cone to 
um, bring out awareness of the missing and murdered wow. indigenous women. And that will be hopefully ready to be uh, sold in August. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. And then um, uh, just last week, we discovered that we were the leading jiggled cone sellers of North America. So the majority of the people have been purchasing our cones rather than the uh, Taiwan cones. And um, also, uh, I'm a huge uh, recycle um, waste free person. So 100% from our boxes to our, our plastics to our even our metal, it's 100% recyclable too. So um, it's what we did is, well, all of our metal scraps, um, uh, what we can, or with our metal scraps, we have these big bins, which is like the size of me. We fill them up with scraps and then we give it to a company which they mouth them, and then they use it for other things like spoons and forks and stuff like that. So that's pretty neat. And uh, a struggle with that is, um, I was in high school, I was 16 years old. So I was doing my pre-calc, my chemistry, my bio. I was taking all my classes, I had a full schedule, and on top of that, I had that business. So I was probably getting about four hours of sleep. And something that to me was very shocking was when I had my business plan, I had all my documents and everything. I paid a ton of money for all of that. We went to all these different banks, to every bank that's in Canada, and they all said no, because I was too young. Because my mom is a single parent with seven kids. And of course, you know, being a single parent with seven kids, you're not gonna have a good credit score. <laughs> So we, it was actually, and I, and I mentioned this at every presentation, I'm super thankful that Future Printer and Women's Enterprise, they funded me and they believed in me. And now I made my dream come true. Um, so this is a picture of me at the awards last year. And then uh, something that I always like to say to everyone is to do what you love and to do it with passion. If I didn't have passion towards, you know, my culture, my language, dads, even making, uh, even uh, bringing up the authenticity in the jingle dress cone, I wouldn't be doing this. I'd probably be a teacher because that was the route that I was initially going for. And um, my mom told me to add, to strive to move forward, to grow, to heal, to learn, to make positive changes because um, you always have to have a positivity, a positive mentality, because when all those things said no to me, it kind of, it kind of crushed me a bit. Because it's like, well, if they don't believe me, like, who else is gonna believe me, right? If no, if they're not gonna support me, who else is gonna support me? And then, like, sometimes I would really doubt myself and be like, am I, am I really the one to do this? Like, you know, like I, I, like, I didn't really uh, become, like, fully uh, culturally motivated or into my culture, like, right off the bat. I was like, I don't have a Powell family. I don't have, you know, all this and that. I wasn't even, um, you know, I didn't grow up with Beaver. The, the first set of Beaver, I was 13 years old, and what I did is I went to, to Bingo, and I did the canteen, and they would, serve, they would give me 25 bucks. Uh, a night. So what I did is I saved up a year's worth of bingo savings and I spent on uh, that or the picture of me with uh, that B work and it cost me a thousand bucks. So a full year of saving. And then my siblings and my friends would be like, oh let's just go shopping to pull no. No. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, something that I really like to say to the youth is that you know, like even if you come from a place that's, you know, that you're, you don't come from a, a Powell family or you weren't, you know, um, like your your parents, your grandparents didn't know the the your language or you, your parents or your grandparents had a cultural break due to um, residential school, etc. Um, 
you have to be the one to be able to, to grow from that and to reclaim your identity, your, your uh, create identity.